Now, last, uh, last Lord's Day, I, I took that special um, uh, section to show you R.C. Sproul um, many, many years ago when, uh, when he introduced Ecclesiastes to his class. And uh, you remember that, um, that he talked very, very much or drove home the cyclical worldview which, uh, which, which uh, is in complete opposition to the linear worldview that the Bible teaches. And uh, that is not just a difference in perspective. It's not just a difference in philosophy. It is a difference due to revelation. Uh, and we come again to stress the point, we stress this in Job, uh, in a very strong way, and we come again, even as we approach Ecclesiastes, to stress the same point, and that is that, um, that man in, on his own, without the revelation of God, without the Word of God, without the things that the Word of God tells us about ourselves and about who God is, and all that that entails, Man in his natural and fallen state will revert to, will, uh, will um, decline to that cyclical worldview. And we can say that that's for several reasons. Number one is his creation is a finite one, and there is only so far he can go. Man thinks that he is able to uh, accomplish anything and everything with his five senses and his brain, and yet there is, as the Word of God tells us, there is so much that is out of his reach uh, in any event that, uh, that he is uh, incapable of, uh, of accomplishing what he wants, which is to be the master of his universe, and that because of the sinfulness of his finite state, which man also wants to deny and push off, he is um, corrupted to a natural decline or natural deterioration of his own point of view and his own optimism. Um, I, I like to remind people that uh, you know the entire world is subject to the second law of thermodynamics, the decline that naturally happens to anything in the material world. And that that, 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 and I sometimes surprise people to say that includes the Church of Jesus Christ. That the Church is subject to that kind of decline and deterioration. And that if it were not for the Holy Spirit to, to uh, return us uh, historically to the Word of God and to revitalize our souls, uh, we would have destroyed the Church ourselves long ago. And uh, history is, is filled with those, with those revivals, if you want to call them. I don't like the word revival, but reformation uh, and renewal and restoration of the church again and again and again and again whenever it is needed. And that is due to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, not because man is, the Christian is able to advance any farther. He's actually subject to his own limitations and his own sin. And uh, so, but we have the different point of views. We have the cyclical point of view, which is what man is prone to, to give himself to and to conclude, and that it is because it goes around and around and around that it does not take long before the man re regards life itself as pointless. And, uh, and that philosophical point of view goes, is ancient. It goes all the way back. And... Uh, to even to the depths of discouragement in mankind. And when uh, you know, the rise of evolutionary theory came along, it kind of proved the point that, uh, that yes, this is, this is all there is and that life really does not have meaning. It underscored that. If we come from germs, if we come from uh, you know, the, 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 sim the so-called simple uh, cells and, and we've evolved without meaning, without destiny, without purpose or dignity, as R.C. Sproul says, then um, there is no purpose to life. And so that uh, it, uh, sinful, finite man embraced evolution 
because it underscored his, not only his cyclic, cyclical viewpoint, in spite of the fact that it was um, uh, negative, but uh, it also helped him to stand apart from God and from the word of God and from the revelation of God that called him to believe something else. His stubbornness was underscored by that, and he has taken it and run with it. Uh, and so uh, that, that is the, the idea that there is a beginning, there is an, a middle, and there is an end. There is a story to life is something that takes sinful man out of his own control, and he doesn't want to go there. And uh, then we, you remember, we, I spent the rest of the hour talking about authorship and why it is that Ecclesiastes is, uh, receives so much controversy about authorship. And the conclusion was is that it was, it was a book that uh, most likely, and for various and sundry minor reasons, uh, was probably pushed back, uh, probably was not written during the life of Solomon, but was probably written much, much, much later, uh, and, oh, and was written by somebody we don't know and claimed to be Solomon, but kind of hid it in that nickname, uh, Kohelet, preacher, um, to uh, disguise the fact that he was not the, uh, he, that he was the author, not Solomon, but kind of confused people. And the, the, but the problem with all of those things, and, and, you know, I, and I, I, I pointed out to you that as, as, the, as the subject of authorship in critical scholarship kind of rose with intensity to the point where you, know, you can even open up uh, commentaries today and, say, and they'll say, well, nobody today believes that Solomon wrote the book. You know, everybody's, you know, all scholars are agreed that it's, way, you know, that can't be. All of those have, have been answered. All of those objections have been answered. That was, the, that was where we left it. And the reason I stress that, the reason that I make a big point of that here, is because it returns us to the very reason the book exists. And the uh, reason that the book exists is inherent in the theme and the teaching of the book and to my mind returns us very pointedly to a Solomonic authorship. And let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at a proposed outline of the book. Um, the book does not come with these outlines, and so we can only you know, impress or impose our own ideas on it. Uh, but in this case, the, uh, there is a prologue and an epilogue uh, and that reminds us of the book of Job, which had the same kind of uh, things. In this case, the uh, prologue and the epilogue are set aside from the rest of the book as um, uh, in nature of the fact that, it, uh, that the, the prologue and the epilogue are spoken of in the third person. Uh, it doesn't start the autobiographical section where the writer refers to himself in the first person, uh, un, uh, until the body of the book, which starts in chapter 1, verse 12, goes on through the rest of the book until chapter, eight, uh, tw chapter 12, verse 7. And so, you know, there is a possibility that the bulk of the material was written by Solomon, and perhaps an, uh, an amuensis, in other words, a secretary, uh, or... Um, somebody writing after Solomon's death, uh, or somebody but that was not too separated from Solomon's period, could have put the prologue and the epilogue on to complete the book and to, to round it out. But um, uh, the, the sections uh, that we have in, the, in, in this breakdown includes the, the prologue, which, which speaks first and introduces the whole book speaking about the temporal character of everything in this life. And we remember that, you know, the, the, the formula that it keeps coming back to, under the sun, under the sun, as being the, the key phrase that because of its repetition, and in Hebrew repetition is a big deal, uh, the, you know, we say today, read between the lines. And what we mean by that is, you know, read something and 
come to a conclusion based on what, uh, on what it means, based on what you yourself can perceive and know, rather than what's spelled out clearly. Under the sun is kind of like read between the lines. Um, and, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to look at that. Then uh, in the epilogue, it returns to the third person again and, and winds up almost suddenly. Um, well, that's the way things are. Eat, drink, and, and enjoy yourself because that's what you have. And uh, fear God. And, and that's the end of it. Uh, which, which sounds to me like it might have been you know, an, a secretary uh, or, or trying to wrap the book up after Solomon's material was, was, was submitted. Uh, and not wanting necessarily to, um, to contribute himself, but to try to summarize in a very quick way the, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what Solomon was saying. And that leaves us with the body of the book. The body of the book is, is, can be, can be uh, loosely divided into two different sections. There's the thematic sessions where, sections where he's speaking about certain issues, certain um, uh, things that, uh, that he, he waxes eloquent on, and then it, it kind of reverts to proverbial sayings. And I, I say the word revert because by the time he gets to chapter 9, there is this, the, the arguments and the observations kind of reduce themselves to s mere sentences that kind of try to wrap up everything. He's done teaching now. He's just simply saying, you know, advice to his grandchild, uh, you know, or something like that. And so it's, it's smaller sentences, smaller uh, voices. And the, the thematic sections include the frustrating character of wisdom, pleasure, and projects, um, all very identifiable to the, to the person living in a circular point of view. Uh, you know, wh why am I going through all of this, and wh what's the point? The divinely appointed time frames of life uh, here he's, he's reminding us that, that there is a cyclical pattern to life. There is a time for this, there is a time for that, and that those times are, are not to be, but it, you know, ironically, those times are not to be just dismissed or thrown away because they're cyclical. Yeah, the seasons come every year, but they come with a purpose. Spring is coming, the farmer needs to get ready, and he plants accordingly. He doesn't just say, well, spring will come next year, or yeah, the cycles are, you know, there's not a, you know, he's, he, there is a wisdom injected into the fact, yes, God does make certain cycles to life that are predictable, and you should use that for your own advantage. Um, there, the uh, agonies of oppression and labor are expressed in chapter 4, and interestingly enough, right in the heart of this is the solemnity of worship, uh, again, not denying the um, the presence and the power of God. He calls you to uh, acknowledge God and not to ignore Him. There is, that's a, a rejection of that cyclical nature of life. There's the frustration of not enjoying the labor of your hands. It, it almost comes you know, in, the, in the fall <laughs> of the planting season. You know, the, the divinely appointed times, plant your, plant your crops when it's spring. And then, of course, what happens? Uh, there's not enough rain. There's too much rain. There's too much, too much sun, there's not enough sun, there's bugs, there's uh, enemies, and harvest comes along, and it's less than you wanted, and what's the point? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, um, a drain in, in the thinking there. Then you get to the proverbial sayings of the shared destiny of the righteous and the wicked. Uh, why, cyclical argument, why bother being different? Why bother being Moral in an immoral world, why bother this, you know, and, uh, and uh, the searching of, of that in this life, and then advice to the young in viewing of the coming of old age and death in, a, in chapter 11. That, I think, is the key to the Solomonic authorship, is this um, com continuing uh, aging process. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy with, with that and seeing Solomon as the author. And here's what I mean by that. Um, Solomon is credited for uh, ever since the, uh, you know, the early uh, Jewish traditions 
Solomon is credited with writing uh, all three books, the Song of Songs, the Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And, uh, and we, as I've pointed out, in, in Song of Songs and in Proverbs, he names himself very clearly. He says, I, Solomon, am writing this. doesn't have any problem with that. But there is a change in his own attitude and his own perspective as he writes. Um, we're going to get into the Song of Songs in a week or two, and, um, but you probably know already that uh, you know, what you have is, is, is some kind of a love poem going on, and uh, it's, it's that, the interpretation of, of Song of Solomon's is going to be one of the wildest things we're going to see. But, there is, but, but, the, but behind the, the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs is a youthful energy. Some would say hormones. There is the, uh, the health and vibrancy of youth, the prospect of uh, conquest, the uh, lure and attraction of beauty and of uh, vigor. There is the magnetism. There is all of the things that go along with, the, with a younger man in pursuit of his beloved. And all of that is, is, uh, is wrapped up in the, in the Song of Solomon. And so that's what we expect. Um, when we get to Proverbs, we find the, uh, the, uh, the voice of reason, the voice of, you know, it starts with, you know, you could almost say, in, in, when you start in Proverbs, you hear him saying, do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> you know, the, the young man has grown now to middle age and he's kind of learned the lessons that he wished he had listened to or practiced when he was younger uh, about a whole lot of things. Uh, he refers to the fool, and that might be autobiographical as well. You know, he says, I, yeah, I was the fool, and so don't do what I did. And, uh, but there is, uh, there is now the contribution of wisdom. He is teaching his own kids. He's hoping they're listening. You remember Proverbs 1 to 8 was, was 1 to 9, it was thoroughly about a father teaching his son. And, and I, I, I've told you before, that's, that's one, of the most, uh, one of the most powerful tools that a father has raising a young man is to go through Proverbs 1 to 9 again and again and again and again because of the wisdom and because of God's teaching in that section. It's very very critical, I think, very important and very relevatory. Uh, and it guards the young man from being a fool. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the Proverbs is rich in, in the expression of wisdom. It's also the period in Solomon's life where he has been given wisdom deliberately by God. Uh, you might remember the story of that. Solomon goes in to pray to God at the beginning of his reign. And it is out of humility that Solomon does not ask for wisdom. He asks, you know, he does, I mean, he does not ask for power. He does not ask for riches. He does not ask for uh, material possessions. Um, he already, in, in, you could say he already knows he's got all that, and that would be true. But he asked for wisdom, and it's interesting, to, you know, you read from Kings, and you find it's wisdom to rule these people, and God grants him that exceptional wisdom, and it's demonstrated, you remember, with the two women fighting over the child, and, uh, and everybody is, is amazed at the wisdom he has to rule. And then you, you read the same account in Chronicles, which was written after the exile, or during the exile, and the, uh, the wisdom that Solomon was given was primarily the wisdom by which to build the temple. And uh, the direction that he could give to his contractors and to his, uh, his, to his workers to build that. And, and so in Chronicles, the climax of the temple's construction and comes with its dedication and the uh, celebration of Solomon's wisdom is, is, is shown there at the dedication of the temple. 
That is the high point. Uh, it's probably in, uh, focused on specifically in Chronicles because of its climactic demonstration of God's wisdom. The wisdom by which to rule would have been something rather constant and continuous, but not necessarily something that would, uh, would demonstrate itself in, uh, in peaks. But as we read of Solomon's own life, we know that he was distracted and drawn away by, from God and therefore from wisdom by the uh, contractual marriages that he kept getting into and the uh, you know, building up of this harem of concubines that preoccupied this rather bored monarch during his reign. Remember, he never fought a war. He never had to legislate anything. Uh, he lived uh, on the, uh, the rewards and the fruits of his father. Uh, and so uh, he lived a long, uh, prosperous, peaceful life and had uh, very little uh, to exercise wisdom in. And, uh, but the one thing he did have, he collected horses, and he collected gold, and he collected wives. And uh, the wives are, is clearly spelled out in, in, uh, in Kings to have uh, that deteriorating effect on him spiritually. Uh, and so as his life uh, is, is more and more given to catering to his wife, wives' demands, and even to the point of sacrificing and worshiping to the gods of the other nations, that uh, although it doesn't say it so sp specifically, it seems rather clear that Solomon um, withdrew from the wisdom of God. And probably just the opposite also, that God's wisdom withdrew from him. So what we have by the time we get to Ecclesiastes, is a man who is now older, probably facing his own death. He knows that death is coming. And uh, he has, if you will, made his own life a discouragement. Uh, you know, we, we, we reach the, in our, in our culture, the biggest climactic point a man will come to is his own retirement. And, uh, you know, if he does not face retirement with some sense of self-identity well secured, he goes into a great deep depression. He has no reason to live. He has no purpose in life. He is not, ambition will not reward him. There isn't anything around. And uh, and that is, a, that, is a, that is a typical thing that, that men will, will, will fall into because he's made by God to be, to have purpose, to provide for his family, to build, to, to, uh, to uh, produce for the glory of God. And now it is because all of his, all of his effort has been uh, con, you know, tied in with his work when his work is taken from him, he feels that emptiness. And so that despair, I think, is coming to Solomon. Uh, he is, um, he is uh, his, his own kingship is winding down. His own life is winding down. He's, he has failed God in a very substantial way. And I think the, the purpose of Ecclesiastes is a result of that sinful abandonment of wisdom. And what comes out then is, uh, is his frustration. He is, he is speaking out of that sinful uh, consequence that has come to him. So this is a man that's on the opposite side of the, of the coin from Proverbs. I've learned, in Proverbs he says, I've learned, I, I've been gifted with this, I, this, is, this is what you should do, this is how you should go, and this is great. And there's still energy in him, but by the time he's an older man, it's, he's tired. And he has seen himself lose. And he has been drained of opportunity and time and strength and vigor. 
and as a result, he probably is in a state where he's feeling sorry for himself, which is a common kind of uh, a mood to have in such a situation. He has also learned the hard way that when wisdom is not attended to, that there is a breakdown of God's blessings on you as a person. You've always depended on your health and strength. You've always, you know, perhaps you've acknowledged this is from God. It's a great thing. But it's your health and strength that you've been able to enjoy. But now that's gone. Where is God now? Uh, that that when, when, when that which you've always had begins to wane, where is God's faithfulness now? And, and, and so that, that self, uh, self-reflection is, uh, is beginning to be a problem. There's a breakdown of, of deed and consequence. You know, I, I try to do what God wants me to do, but he doesn't reward me like he did before. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's a breakdown of, of that kind of thing. And he's also having to be reconciled with the fact that he, his days are numbered and that, uh, that he doesn't have much more to live. And how, what is he going to say now? He's probably angry. He's frustrated. He's in despair. Uh, he, um, he, he can't restore what's been lost. And so what you have, I think, in Ecclesiastes is not only the answer of authorship, that Solomon did write it, but you have the combination of, of authorship and purpose. Why else is the book here? There's, why else would anybody write such a book if it were not Solomon in the results of his kind of condition? And so I think the things, I think authorship and purpose uh, work together uh, to, to pretty much prove or to demonstrate that this is indeed the case, that this is, this is uh, Solomonic in the uh, in expression. And that also helps us if we, can, if we can agree on authorship and on purpose, then we, when we interpret or we study Ecclesiastes and we find it again and again and again and again shutting us down, telling us again, there's nothing new under the sun, there's, nothing, there's no purpose in life, there's no this, there's no that, why bother doing this? You know, when, when we see that pressure we're not seeing, you know, simple revelation from God. Like, this is the truth. This is the way things are. It's not like God has all of a sudden become existential. We are seeing somebody who has given himself to this. And this is the expression. This is God speaking to us through a sinful man and warning us about our own position and our own situation. And, and guiding us back to faithfulness of God now, even in, in, in no matter what stage of life I'm in. And, and, and so that's, uh, you know, I, that's the flow, I think, of that. It's not just, in other words, age. He's not just getting older. But it is the, it is the accumulation of the consequence of sinfulness in his life. And the result of that has now, which is not a cyclical thing, it's a linear thing. The result of that is now despair on his part that has become the worst character in his life. And, uh, and it's, he's, he's struggling with that. He's, he's deeply struggling. Um, so we want to you know, just really brush on the overarching theme of, of the book. I don't have, you know, it's a survey class, so I don't have time to really get into the specifics. But um, there are... Uh, Certain things we want to pick up on, first of all, the, the authorship, uh, the, the, this, this self-proclaimed preacher or Kohelet in the, uh, in the, in the Hebrew, um, and he, uh, uh, he says, I am the, uh, he describes himself so very clearly, it's very you know, obvious that this is Solomon or somebody pretending to be Solomon, uh, and, uh, but he uses this term uh, to uh, describe himself. And, uh, and when, you, when, you get through, when you read into the book and, and the discouragement begins to hit and the cyclical argument begins to flow and all of this other stuff, uh, you, you know, the first thing he says is vanity. It, all is vanity. Well, then wouldn't this book be vanity? Why are you writing this book if everything is vanity? He doesn't believe his own words. That's what he's really saying. That's the glimmer of God's inspiration coming through. You know, he could have just stopped with verse 1. 
Vanity is vanity. Well, okay, then I don't have to read the book. Why bother? I don't have to predict, and he doesn't have to write it. I mean, that's for, you know, what, what's he doing? But in the very declaration that all is vanity, he's teaching us something. And, he, and I think that there is, you know, there is the modicum of his own uh, glimmer of relationship with God that says, this is something I need to say. Even here, I need to teach this. Uh, and, uh, and that word vanity, by the way, is, is, a, is an interesting word. Um, if, if, you, if you've checked with various translations and paraphrases, paraphrases go nuts with this word. Um, anything and everything can be, can be this word. Uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, it's a hebel, and um, generically speaking, it's, it, can be, uh, uh, it can be simply uh, an emptiness, like, uh, like smoke, you naturally think of as without substance and without form, without purpose, it's gone. Uh, emptiness is, is, uh, can be a description simply of itself, uh, as well as a commentary on what it should be. You know, life should be meaningful, but it's empty, it's gahal. And, and so it could be a critical statement that's being made. Um, he, will, he will talk in the, in the book about uh, the effort that he ma- you know, that man makes to produce or to grow or to achieve, and, and that gets him nowhere. And so there's a frustration to work. There's a there's a um, there's a, a, a heartache to productivity uh, that uh, leaves a man empty. Uh, like I said, you know, you, a man can build a house out of logs one day and have it burned to the ground the next. Vanity. What's the point? You know that kind of thing. There's frustration. Is uh, is a is a, a part of a uh, habel, uh, useless, profitless, futile uh, is is the is a word that uh, that comes up with that. There is no other word that is that it comes up in the in the in the book so often as habel, and so there is that striking of the gong every time he says that. You know, it's it's like you know it's it's shaking you, it's reverberating. Uh, and it's making you wrestle with it. But he has to say it again and again and again and again. Why? <laughs> because he wants you to wrestle with it. He wants you to say, no, this can't be right. Something has to be missing here. And, uh, and so there's, there's that sense of uh, repetition uh, to, to, to wake you up. Um, is it all habel? Is it all vanity? Uh, you know, when he says vanity, all is vanity, uh, that is a challenging statement to make. It, it makes the believer, the linear, the one it committed to linear understanding of the world, fight back. No, it's not. Because theologically, I believe that there is purpose in life. Um, then you take it to Job. And yes, there is purpose in frustration. That's, he, would not, he would plant the flag and he would not budge from that. Uh, the, uh, the end result of his friend's advice was, you know, Job did not sin, therefore he should not, there should be not this consequence. And, and so the whole argument of deed consequence is vanity. You know, and he's planning, he's saying, no, that's not the case either. Uh, and it, is also, it can also be discouraging. So it, it's not only theological, it's, it's pragmatic, and it's also psychological or emotional. You know, it, are you going to, it, it's, you know, it makes the one get, going into despair, it, it, makes, it should make him angry. It's there to make him, uh, you know, resentful. To, he fights back. No, this isn't, life is not vain. Uh, there, is, there is purpose. I know that uh, it must be there. I don't know what it is. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why life is so frustrating. But I, I'm going to keep going because I, I see a world, a world view that is linear and not, uh, and not just cyclical. Um, it, it, the, uh, the, the preacher... Uh, you know, goes on to say, you know, we come back to the, we come to the epilogue, and, um, and we notice that in the epilogue, whether Solomon wrote it or somebody else wrote it, 
that he is required to answer these things, even if he does so in a very brief way. He feels like he's got to wrap this up in a way that doesn't point to a cyclical way of life, but to linear. Uh, he says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught people knowledge. Why do that? <laughs> Weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with care. The purpose for the book keeps coming back as a question. You know, why, why this, why that? Why write this? Why give this to us? Uh, and and it's, it's calling us to struggle with these things. Not to just give up, not to just say, yeah, yeah, all oh, life is vanity, and then go off and live like that. But to struggle with it, to say, no, it can't be that way. It's not that way. And, uh, uh, and, he, and the, so the very, the very fact that he works on this uh, means that we are meant to struggle in those three ways, uh, you know, theological and pragmatic and, and emotional. We're to, we're to struggle with this and to emerge on the other side. Um, the, verse 10, the preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly. Uprightly is a moral statement. He believes in right and wrong. He believes in doing an honorable thing to God. Uprightly wrote words of truth. In a cyclical world, there is no such thing as truth. So in every word, it's, you know, we're, we're, being, we're being snapped back to reality as, as believers. Uh, the words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, way to, to put that. Uh, Kohelet is different than the shepherd, um, the, but the shepherd is the pastor. So where is, where does, you know, that just perplexes you to think of that. Um, my son, beware of anything beyond these, wisdom being spoken, uh, beyond the words of the shepherd. The words of the wise are like goads, like nails firmly fixed or collected sayings. They are given by the one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond this. Do not give yourself to foolishness. Back to Proverbs. Uh, uh, very in interesting. Uh, of the and and uh, <laughs> the seminarian's favorite line in the whole book: "Of many of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh." Yes, we would throw that every time we get a reading assignment. You know, read four books by Tuesday. Can I read to you from Ecclesiastes? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they, we, we, that's that's the most that's the book uh, that's the seminarian's favorite verse. Uh, and the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. All is not vain. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That is not proverbial. That is Jesus speaking. You remember what we're going to talk about Jesus uh, next week, but, but we've already mentioned him in the Proverbs study. In Proverbs, you know, the, the deed consequence proverbial sayings were in this life. Uh, you do this, you get that. But with Jesus, the proverbial sayings was, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you. Do what I tell you to do now because it's in the next life you will be rewarded. And so here's a glimpse of even that. And so perhaps there is a reference here inspired by God even beyond Solomon's understanding of the Messiah. Um, you remember in Job, the reference to the Messiah was very clear in chapter 19. Uh, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes, it's not so clear, but perhaps there is the inspired reference, just like, just like the prophets would often write things that they did not understand, and yet now we see are very clear in their reference to the Messiah. This, this falls in that, in that same kind of situation. The epilogue is required as if to explain all these things. He refers to the, uh, the preacher's Previous valuable work uh, in Proverbs and the preacher's aim has been to encourage and enrich as well as to speak the truth righteously. 
you know, it, it's, it, so the, the book ends with those loud, that loud statement, uh, you know, do, live, trust, believe, uh, practice wisdom, rejoice, uh, do all those verbs, as I say and not as I did. Uh, Solomon really, really does collapse at the end of his life as a discouraged man uh, and distant from God. And so this is just the last effort of proverbial statements from a man who has been badly corrupted in his own soul by himself and his own sinfulness. Uh, we go back to chapter 1 and the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the teaching section. And uh, just to give you an illustration of, of uh, how this develops, the, uh, the humanist circle illustrates vanity. Uh, you know, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, hastens to the place where it rises for the next one. The wind blows to the south, goes to the north, around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they, are, they flow again. Uh, you know, there's, he says, there, there's the cyclical uh, argument of, of humanity. People grow, they marry, they have children, they die. When you, have, when you are getting married, you are young, you are vibrant, you're that Proverbs kind of young man, that song of songs now is coming to your mind. You have energy, you have, uh, you have hope, you have joy, you have companionship, you have intimacy, you have all of those things. Life is great. You don't think that's a bore. You don't think this is vanity. Why? Because you have all it takes to enjoy them. The Lord has gifted you with these things, whether you acknowledge God's gift to you or not. You are able to enjoy all these things, so it's not vanity for you. And then you start to have children. Some people say that's... Mm -hmm. But raising the children itself can be... Uh, is a joy and a promise. You certainly, parents invested in their children, certainly see purpose in raising their children correctly. They're not going to give up on them. They're going to keep after them and keep after them and keep after them. They're going to point them to Christ. They're going to pray for them. There's a purpose in raising kids. And then, of course, you get to grandchildren, and there's a wonderful, special delight there. But when you get tired and life has been discouraging to you personally, you look at those things and you say, eh, it just happens all the time. Yeah, people get married. Nah, I don't want to go to the wedding. You know, what is, somebody's having a shower. No, I, I don't think I want to do that. Just, somebody's got grandchildren. Well, whoop de doo you know. Life gets bored, boring in that sense. And it's the, it's, the, it's the person's own fault that makes him look at the world now and say, there's no purpose in this. But to do so in a way that sounds absolute is a sin in itself. It's a sin in itself to say, well, because I'm tired and I'm run down and I'm bored, uh, that there's no purpose in life. You know what people call that today? Crotchety old man. I mean, my wife and I were having a discussion this morning. I'm tell her again, I'm aspiring to be a crotchety old man. <laughs> there's the difference. You know, when you're young and you're looking forward to Christmas, there's nothing more magical. There's nothing more wondrous. There's nothing more exciting. Building up to Christmas, getting the tree, decorating the tree, dancing around the tree, uh, presents wrapped under the tree, all of the baked things that mom makes, all the special things. It's all, for a young child, it's very exciting and you know, and, and we understand what it's all about. It's a celebration of the birth of Christ. There can be nothing more glorious than that. But when, you, when you're an old fuss budget, you don't care about those things. You don't care. Let them decorate the tree. Let them knock themselves out. You want to go to a concert? No, I don't want to go to a concert. It's you. It's not reality. It's you that's grown that way. And, and you, have, you are giving in to to the, the lack of delight that the Lord has given to life. And as a result of that giving in, you're saying it's all worthless. It's all vanity. Nothing really matters. 
call coming down tomorrow. What a great person to be around, you know. So Kohelet is bored. He is bored, and, and it reflects on, on the fact that he doesn't, he, he's, he's, uh, he's given himself to this. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has, be, what has been is what will be, and what has done, been done, it will be done, will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. It's like he slaps us with that, with that you can't top this. You can't, uh, it's all the same, it's all under the sun. Like, that closes the argument off. Don't bother responding to me. All is vanity. This is all under the sun. It's all the same. It's all, nothing changes. Under the sun is not as used as often as, as vanity is. It's used 29 times, but it has the same effect. It's the chorus of the despair. It's the chorus of the, of the one who's given up. It's the one not speaking of the truth of reality. He's the one who doesn't have a, a purpose in life because his energy's gone, his life is gone. He's facing the grave. He doesn't have any wisdom left. And all he can say is revert back to that cyclical argument. Um, Pastor Barton, yeah. And I think I've said this to you before in one way or another, but I think to me what makes Ecclesiastes so unenjoyable to read <laughs> is um, there's regret, you know, but no repentance. Yeah. Right. You know, he's, he's no David. No. You know, um, you know, out of the depths I've cried for you. You're right. There's no repentance. Uh, there, is, there is regret. Not enough to say, I wish, you know, should have done that, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Uh, he has, he's gone beyond that. You know, there's, there's, there's no point in woulda, shoulda, coulda because uh, nothing makes any difference, any sense. And, you know, when, when, that, when that happens, wisdom has been withdrawn from him, except when he is putting pen to paper and it comes out in those glimmers that we talked about. Uh, and that, uh, that we're, you know, we're meant to wrestle with this. We're meant to get angry with this. When you read Ecclesiastes and you agree with the guy, then you need to repent yourself. That's the point, uh, you know, and that's a, that's a very good uh, illustration to make. Uh, revelation of how deterioration has fallen in, uh, in Solomon's thinking, I think, shows up in several places. Here is chapter, uh, I guess it's still one. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, yes, chapter one, and I applied my heart. That, that's, a, that's a very curious phrase. I applied my heart. What in the world does that mean? I applied my heart. It's the only time the word is the phrase is ever used in Scripture, so there's nothing to compare it to. Uh, and uh, it says, I've applied my heart to seek and search out by wisdom. Uh, wisdom by this time becomes a tool that he thinks he has. I sit down and I use wisdom to determine this. It's like it's become a tool. Remember what wisdom really is? Wisdom is worship. Wisdom is the fear of God. You know, Proverbs told us that. Job told us that. Wisdom is we have to, we have to worship God and hear Him speak or else we are fools. We have no knowledge, no wisdom whatsoever. But he has used it now, he, or he, just, he just regards himself as someone who's got wisdom and he uses it like a tool, he uses it, and when he does such, it fails him. It, leaves him. it leads him to that despair. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Wisdom has taught me this. Who are you trying to kid? You know, it, it makes you, it makes the, you, you, have, you are forced to stand up and say, no, we're, you're wrong. This is not wisdom. You have reverted to foolishness. 
What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. That's a, that's, that's, that's a commentary on the weakness of man. Um, he's not looking to God to, to straighten out something that's crooked. He's saying, man can't do this. Even if he aspires, even if, he, you know, even if we build hospitals, and even if we, uh, even if we advance in technologi- technology and medicine, we aren't going to be able to heal a broken bone well. He's, he's limiting man in what man can and should and indeed is called to do because he shut it down. He just dismisses it. Uh, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom. He's, he's acting like now he's... He's, he's, he's purchased it. Acquired wisdom? What, when did you acquire wisdom? How did you acquire wisdom? I went to the store. I checked out a book. I have lived years and now I am wise. No, none of that is true. Wisdom was your gift because you worshiped God. You prayed to God, not for riches, not for power, not for wealth, but for wi- Wisdom. And he gave it to you, and now you've thrown that away. Your heart is now tied up with those material possessions. It's tied up with your wives. It's tied up with your, your wealth. It's tied up with your peace and your boredom. And so wisdom is the one thing you don't have. For in much wisdom is much vexation. That's a, that, I think that's a curse. I think he's cursing God here. And he who increases in knowledge increases in sorrow Remember what 1 Corinthians Kings says, I'm sorry, 1 Kings says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. His wives turned away his heart, for Solomon was old. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Um, The worship of, of the pagan gods was gory, sexual, immoral, as any idolatry is, and bold. And so it's not just that he, uh, you know, went to church in another, uh, he went to worship in another church one day, you know, or something like that. He was giving himself to the horrors of cyclical thinking. And you cannot work, you, you are, you know, remember a fundamental principle of life. You will be consumed by what you worship. Christianity is no different. You worship the one true God, you you will be poured out like a drink offering. You will be consumed by what you worship. But of course, with Christianity, there is new life. But if you give yourself to the worship of something else, it will also consume you. Whatever you worship will consume you. And so you must be careful about what you're giving your life to. Solomon has given his life to the worship of other gods. But he does not have the reward that he had before. So the body of the message can be lumped together in, uh, in, in some principles here. Uh, you know, lack of meaning robs life of its purpose. Uh, Life is full of transitions and repetitions, life's frustrations. Worship is sobering and meaningful. That's the the section you probably want to start reading, Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, and and go from there. Uh, Wealth is a blessing and a curse. Uh, So it's it's, uh, it's all kinds of, of, of areas by which to attack the point, wrestle with the point, and come to the conclusion that you're supposed to come to which is to disagree and to take issue with. And, and in the process of doing that, you know what you're doing? Is you're driving yourself back to God. He, you know, in his sinfulness, is testing you to drive you away from God too. And when you read and you wrestle with Ecclesiastes, you drive yourself back to God. You drive yourself back to worship. So, you know, we talk about the gospel being, you know, your basic fork in the road. You're going down your path, there's the cross, and you can go to the left of it or the right of it. If you go to the right of it, 
you believe in Jesus with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you obey God, you, you live a life of, uh, of uh, trusting in Him. Or you choose the other path. And Ecclesiastes is just doing the same thing. Which way are you going to go? Which way are you going to go? And believe me, if you go the one way, your life will be vanity. Because without God, there is no purpose to life. But with the Lord, there is everything. There is blessing. There is meaning. There is purpose. There is fulfillment. There is joy. And there is reward. Okay?